today I'm creating a billet from this piece of saw steel. It's a sawmill blade actually that spent you know, its life in the sawmill, cutting up lumber, milling lumber. It's got some history behind it, even though it's not a super old piece of steel, but that's some nostalgia right there. I'm combining that with some 1095 high carbon steel, which is simply a good blade steel. And the saw steel is the 15 and 20. That's the steel that has nickel content. So we'll put these two steels together, which on their own both make a great blade if worked properly. And we're gonna be able to create a really neat pattern. And we're gonna be able to create something that somebody will use for years and years to come. And it's gonna, it's gonna take on its own nostalgia because of that. You know, when somebody comes to me and, and says, hey, can you build this knife for me? Or here's what I'm thinking, or you know, I want this kind of knife. I, I understand that it's, um, I'm not just making them a knife. I'm, I'm making them something, I'm building something for them that already has significance in their minds. My job is to bring that to a, a physical object, if you will, and so, when they open that package up and they, and, they, and they get that knife, my goal is to exceed their expectations and not only in building a quality, high-performing tool, a blade, but also to, to speak to the part of their soul, I guess, that inspired them to, uh, to commission this piece in the first place. So the way most pattern welded steel blades are created today is by combining a high carbon steel of one kind and then another high carbon steel of a certain kind that has some nickel content to it, so about 2% usually. A couple that come to mind off the top of my head are uh, 15 and 20, which is what I use typically, and L6 is another one that has enough nickel content in it to uh, create a pattern when combined with another type of steel. The nickel content is going to resist that acid and so whatever we've done with those pieces of steel prior to that is going to be revealed at the end of the project and, and show us what we have there. Regardless of what your intended finished product is going to look like or your desired results, a, a Damascus or pattern welded steel billet always begins with combining different types of steel. In some cases that's uh, high carbon steel and low carbon steel or steels of uh, relatively similar carbon content for a much more subtle pattern in different types of projects. But it's always going to start with combining pieces of steel and of some shape by forge welding together. Forge welding is a process that's been done for thousands of years and it's, it's a study all on its own. It's a lot of fun to do. You're literally taking two different pieces of steel and making them one, or in some cases multiple pieces of steel, and making them one piece of steel. Forge welding is something that requires a high heat, we're talking in the neighborhood of 2000 degrees, and the right atmospheric conditions, uh, specifically no atmosphere. If you have oxygen contact in that super hot steel, you're going to get what's known as oxide iron oxide, it, that's a scale that covers the steel. And so protecting that steel is, is important. Having that steel be clean and free from that scale in the first place is important. Once I have my pieces of steel clean and ready to put together, I need to be able to hold them together tightly uh, while they're heating up in the forge and prior to actually forge welding those pieces together. One of the easiest, simplest ways to do this is simply use a arc welder or some kind of you know, welder, MIG welder, whatever, to, to tack those pieces together. This has nothing to do with the forge welding process except for holding those pieces of steel together so that we can effectively and successfully forge weld them together when the time comes.
The way a forge weld actually takes place is through a combination of heat and pressure. Technically, I guess, theoretically, you could forge weld or can forge weld steel if you have enough pressure without really much heat, but obviously, practically speaking, we, uh, we don't have that kind of pressure uh, ability. So we need heat, and like I said before, in the neighborhood of 2,000 degrees, depending on different factors, and then some way to uh, press it or hammer it together. And of course, for generations, hammers were really the only thing that you had available to do this kind of work with. And uh, that would include, you know, two people working with larger hammers. And so forging Damascus or pattern welded steel of the various sorts that different cultures came up with over the last thousands of years is absolutely doable with just hand tools and, and hammers. But when it comes to one person working at a reasonable uh, pace that allows me to sell a blade for something that's a reasonable price, uh, having something like a press or a power hammer is very, I think, crucial to, to the craft. There's a level of preparation that goes into the billet before you've ever even started to make anything that looks like a knife that requires a, a significant amount of work. And that's one reason why your Damascus steel, your quality Damascus steel blades are going to cost more. The goal for the billet that I'm working on today, the billet being the chunk of steel that we're going to end up with after we've forged welded all these pieces together, is to end up with about between 160 and 180 layers. So we're starting with 25 layers of steel. We will forge those out once they're forged welded together, cut it up, and combine those into a billet. So that's going to put us somewhere a little under 100 layers, and then we'll fold it and forge weld it together again to give ourselves you know, 160 to 180 layers depending on how much we've ground off when we're cleaning off the billet, that kind of thing. But that's about the, the layer count that I want to go for. Really, there's a sort of a common misconception these days that calling pattern welded steel Damascus is some kind of grievous misrepresentation. When in fact, uh, steel, pattern welded steel that's, that bears a Damascene if I'm saying that right, uh, appearance or pattern to it has been called Damascus steel for centuries actually. Whether it was in gun barrels or fancy swords and blades, uh, it's been called that for a long, long time. And that is not the historic, actually, Wootz steel is what, what most people are referring to when they are, are talking about historic Damascus steel. Uh, you know, historic Damascus steel didn't necessarily originate in Damascus. Uh, there's some conjecture as to why the name, why the name, Damascus was a large trade center or hub. And so it's likely that the name comes from these different products being, you know, bought and sold in that area. The original Damascus steel, where that comes from is a process that um, is, is simply a process of working with steel and the pattern was derived from naturally occurring alloy components like vanadium and uh, different things that would create carbide segregations in such a way as to uh, make a pattern on the finished blade. And without getting into too much of the metallurgy of it, that's not the same thing as what we're doing with pattern welded steel today. What we're doing is, is um, simpler. We're combining two different types of steels, namely one steel that has some nickel uh, content to it and, and another steel that doesn't. Now that we have our 160, 180 layer billet, we have the foundation of a, a cool piece of steel. We're actually going to go for a, a 
well-loved pattern known as a raindrop pattern. It's kind of a modified version of that. So now that we have our layer count, we can actually begin to put what you might call the programming into this billet that's going to result in the desired look at the end of the end of the project when we have a finished blade.